thank you so much for chatting with me today. Um, I am a huge fan of shrinking, and so I'm excited to hear more about your process. Nice to have me, yeah. So let's start from the top, from the theme song. Uh, you collaborated with Ben Gibbard on the, the theme song, Frightening Fishes. Uh, what was it like collaborating with Ben, and, and why was he the right fit for this for this theme song? Well, I think, I mean, initially, we knew that there was going to be a song for the main title in Shrinking, as there had been for Ted. Um, and it, uh, but we, taught long, we thought long and hard about the right vocalist and the right sort of tone of it. And Death Cab for Cutie came up in conversation in terms of, just the lyrical content and the way that he delivers the vocals and everything about that. And uh, the producers reached out to him and said, would you be interested? And he said, yes, we got on a phone call together, a sort of, you know, a four way phone call. And I said, well, look, I'm, I'm kind of, I don't know, at that point I might've been three episodes in or something. And I said, I've got a, I've got some material. Shall I cobble some ideas together and just send you a, a Dropbox link and you can flick through and see if there's anything useful. Otherwise we'll just start from scratch. But I think it's always nice if the song is related to the, you know, it's not just a kind of something that's tagged on as a kind of independent thing. You know, it has some sort of relation to the show. So I sent him three ideas and uh, he actually sort of hummed a kind of top line over all of them. Um, and then he sent them back to me and said, well, what do you think? And I said, well, I think this one um, is the strongest. You know, what do you think? And he said, well, I agree. And I then went away, and um, at that point, it was a sort of cue, really, from the, um, you know, for the show. And I then went away and fleshed that out to be a sort of song structure, stroke the right length with verse, you know, bridge, drop that. And then I sent it back to him, and he put a vocal over the top. I'd done some vocals my end as well as sort of guide, um, you know, here's some ideas. And a lot of the score has got vocals in it anyway. Um, and he then came back and said, I've got this lyric idea, you know, what do you think of this? And I said, it's brilliant. I mean, it's it's so on point, I think. And he really sort of um, did his research on that as well in terms of some of the phrases. But I thought it was it was excellent. And then we had a bit of back and forth where he'd send me something and I'd then say, can you double that down the octave? And then I'd add some harmonies to it. And then I sort of slowly just built the track up um and uh and then we ended up with a full length version and obviously the the 30 second version you hear in the title so it was a bit of a back and forth but i mean he's he's a perfect fit i think and his his delivery is great and um and i think it really works as a song overall so yeah i'm really delighted with how that turned out and, and delighted that he wanted to do it absolutely it is it like you said it's such a perfect fit it fits the opening so well so those those ideas that you sent him uh yep. the, the musical themes were those like pieces of score that you had already done or were they specific theme ideas you had already had for the theme song? Uh, well, a bit of both actually. Okay. Um, so yeah, one was a, there, there's, I mean, as is often the way you can't, particularly on a show like this, there aren't that many moments actually in a score where you can get really, really big. There's the exception to that, like the kind of in episode one where um, there's a boxing sequence early on and there's a, there's a moment there to kind of give it a lot of energy. Um, but what I sent him initially was probably too big. Um, you know, I'd kind of throw in the kitchen sink at it in a couple of places and kind of, you know, those were some initial thoughts. I mean, when I work with, um, not on everything, but when I work with um, Bill and Kip on, you know, on, on, I've done four or five things for them now, they, they're nice enough to ask me to do something early on, which I know sounds like, why would you want, but I like to be involved early if possible, because it gives you a chance when you get hired right at the end and there might even be a kind of date on a poster and you've got to hit it, you know, you don't have many opportunities to go down the wrong path and then come back and change your mind and try something else. You really just have to commit to something and, and go for it. And that can be positive sometimes in that you, you know, you go for it and you kind of build on something and it can, it can be good. But I think that, you know, having a, a relationship with somebody where you can do something that maybe isn't quite right and they can tell you, and no one feels in jeopardy or danger that they're kind of about to, you know, be replaced or, you know, you do something completely crazy and say, what do you think of this? And they go, well, I don't like it. And you go, well, that's okay. I can try something else. You know, that's always a great feeling. So some of those, um, I had a folder just full of um, ideas and obviously not all of them made it in the show. And as I kind of hone the sound down further and further, a lot of those get 
jettison but I, i'll often work like that i mean on, on a film like um sometimes with animations i come on very early because they they're storyboarding and they need music and in the case of like those uh, Arben films like Shaun the Sheep, I, I might come on 18 months before the end and write four and a half hours of music that then gets down, whittled down to 70 minutes. But I don't see that as a waste of time. I see it as a great result because I can try something totally crazy and they can say, that's great and it's different or mm, not quite right. And I've got time to change tack. So, yeah. That's wonderful. I, I'd, I'd love to hear what that process was like for shrinking. So when you first came on to the project what was your process where did you get started how did you develop the sound for for shrinking well actually i almost went full circle on that because so initially when i you everything you do right i mean i think that we all do we try to give each show or film a unique sound world and thematic ideas and all the rest of it and so i started thinking what would this sound like and it's it's all set in california and so I thought, well, it's got to sound Californian. So then I was trying to think of everything that to me is associated with that sound. And uh, I tried a number of band ideas in terms of, you know, different sounds, but it's really settled down on initially. I started listening to a lot of Beach Boys, basically. And to me, that's the quintessential kind of California sound. Now that originally I went down a whole kind of rabbit hole of actually making things sound vintage you know, like as if they were from that era, lots of hiss on everything and all that. And that was not a great idea, but that some of those sounds then kind of carried over. So the final, um, you know, score has a lot of vocal harmonies in it in places, but also it's got sort of organ in it. And the bass sound is quite a vintage um, bass sound. And, um, but yeah, there's a lot of sort of yeah, Hammond organ and kind of like, um, things like that sort of subtly underneath, which kind of remain from that sort of um, sound world. So I'd say it's kind of, it's kind of got, it's got acoustic guitar and piano in it in places. And the main melody for T for Tia, the, the wife, which is kind of throughout the show is on, is on piano in a couple of spots, it's solo piano. But most of the cues that then are around that, they're augmented with, you know, drums and organs and, um, you know, electric guitars that sound a little bit vintage, you know. That's great. What do you? What sort of direction did you get when you came on the project, or or is it kind of free reign since you've worked with these creators before? It is a bit free reign, but I, you know, I I very much have a um, as I said, the nice thing about working with people more than once is that you get a a rapport going, and you know what they, um, whether you can deliver it straight away or not, but you have a kind of rapport of knowing what you think that they might be wanting and how you can get there. And also, as I said, I felt brave enough to share. I, I would speak a lot with Richard Brown, music editor, and also Kip Kroger, who's producer. And he and I, we speak all the time. Um, but I would just send him stuff. And as I said, it's fine for him to say, I'm not sure about that, or I think it could, it's lacking energy, or it could be, you know. And so that's a nice way to work in a way because together we're sort of you know music to if you want to write music you can go and write music right but if you want to write music to picture whether it's film or tv is a collaborative process with the filmmakers and all you're trying to do is serve picture really and so having him as a kind of soundboard um which I, and i i do that on i've done that on everything we've worked on it's really important to have um feels like you've got somebody on the inner circle like inside trading really you know and he can come back and kind of tell you give you early feedback and also that the by sending them stuff early when they're in the edit before they put temp music on and you know if you're trying to find a sound for something it can often be difficult to do that if you're late on something and it's suddenly now got you know i don't know what something or the, the dark night all over it you know and everyone goes well we love this and you're slightly pigeonholed in that thing so if you can get on early and they can be trying your tracks in the edit um, and so I'd often get a try, I might get a, send them something and then they would put it onto a scene, send it back to me and say, well, this, this, this is feeling good, isn't it? But maybe it needs to pick up pace in the second half. And I go, yeah, it does. And you can, you're looking at the picture and you, you can totally agree and then move from there without being, oh, now I've got to do something that's in the vein of X, Y, and Z, you know, so. Yeah, I, I want to hear more about this, the, the actual scoring process. Uh, once you've done the work to develop the sound, how do you match it to picture? Are you just watching and kind of marking, okay, we need, yeah, we need I, a piece of music here? I do. I watch it. 
I mean, I watch the picture like incessantly to the point where I know where people are breathing and blinking and all kinds of things. And I don't worry too much that certainly early on about actually what the, um, you know, a lot of the time now we're, we're on click tracks for, for, you know, things, but actually I, tr I tend not to worry too much about that. And so a lot of the piano things that you hear in the show, they're completely just playing free time. And I have, I don't know if you can see here, but I have in my studio here, I have, um, a drum kit and then there's an upright piano i don't even see it in there and there's yeah. guitar amps but basically i i've got a, another screen in there and i can go in and i can i can put down drums and then i can play bass and i can play piano and i can layer up parts but i usually put a piano down first particularly if it's an emotional um scene and then i'll play along to the picture and usually i'll just i don't i don't tend to do it bit by bit i just play something that feels good and if it doesn't quite match the picture, I just play the whole thing again. And I, I might do it 12 times until I have what I feel is well. The same piece of music, but I'll play it round and round and I go, that is now feeling good. And then I'll work out the click. And so the the the, the music has a bit of an ebb and flow to it rather than being, well, this is what it's going to be mm. straight on the thing. Now, obviously, there's if something's more groove-based, which obviously some of the score is, then I'll start with a with a tempo and see how that matches and feels good to the picture. And then I'll usually put down some drums um, and then a bass and then build it out from there. That's awesome. Uh, shrinking is is interesting. There's so many needle drops, so so many uh, songs throughout the the series as well. Um, yeah. I'm curious what your relationship is like with the music supervisors and how you kind of balance out when there's a moment for a song and when there's a moment for score. Yeah. I mean, my relationship with them is very good. I mean, they're great. I mean, you know, Krista, obviously I've known for a long time. And Tony um, VP, I've known again for a very long time. And we worked out, we met, I want to say something like 15 years ago um, when I went for a meeting at ABC, but I, the it's, it can be hard sometimes when you, when you've got a lot of needle drops and the score is, is in around that you have to be careful that you don't um, do too much with the score because you don't want to kind of make the whole thing feel like it's got too much energy. So a lot of the time it's conversations about not just about an individual sequence, but how something feels in the, in the overall flow of the show. And actually a good example of that and uh, didn't work out to my benefit, but in season, in episode one, there's a, there's an initial um, cue um, where Jason's character is listening to all his patients. And it, it's a, probably a two minute sequence or something like that. And um, and I can't actually remember what the final song is because there were so many suggestions there. But I also scored that section, mm. and again, it wasn't it wasn't a waste of time because that then helped me figure out what I was doing elsewhere. And the music there, mate, I reworked it for other sequences. But we couldn't really figure out what should be there. Is it score? Is it song? So we were they Tony and Krista were throwing songs up against that. And I was trying different score. And then, but we all got to watch these quick times back together and talk about it and see what feels right. And in the end, we all agreed that a song would be the best thing to have in there. So um, yeah, my I've pretty involved with with them and um, you know, and in, in spotting they're on, we're all there and everyone's can have an opinion about each sequence and whether it's score, whether it's song, and whether the song's working or whether the score's working. Yeah. It's really cool. Um, yeah. yeah, obviously, uh, you, like you said, you work with Bill Lawrence and Kip and these all the, the same creators for Ted Lasso, which you also score. And of course, yeah. these shows, they're different shows, but they share share creators, share a lot of similar tones and themes. How do you how do you score? Uh, how do you how do you approach them to be different and to, to feel differentiation between the sounds of the two shows that share so much DNA? Well, I think that that idea, as I said, that idea of trying to um, find the a unique sound. So there's no organs in Ted Lasso, for instance. I mean, obviously there are similar instruments in terms of the guitar and the bass, but the bass sound in Shrinking is completely different to the bass sound in in uh, Ted Lasso. And so I try to make the 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 sonic world sound different. And I suppose the music in shrinking i mean there's a couple of other elements in there that you know some of the stuff they were that they were doing around that sort of beach boys era was using a lot of kind of outboard effects to kind of get weird sounds and there's a couple of sounds in there like there's a marimba actually that's going through a kind of um a sort of crystallizer and a delay echo and it sounds pretty quirky and i'd say this the music for shrinking has got a little bit more um quirky factor to it than the music for 
um, Ted Lasso. And um, but, you know, that's always the challenge is, is, is you know, making things feel um, different. But I think even the, um, you know, the piano sound is different. And I think if you put the two soundtracks on side by side, you would, or I hope you would know that they were from different shows, you know, it doesn't cross over too much. It, they do feel different, I think. Totally, totally. Well, my time is running short, Tom. Um, one one more question before I let you go. Um, uh, as I was preparing for this interview, I was, you know, thinking about thinking about the show, thinking about Jason Siegel, and uh, something that kept popping in my head is one of his uh, roles from a number of years ago in Forgetting Sarah Marshall, where Jason yeah. plays a disgruntled TV composer. Uh, <laughs> so I just have to ask, what did Jason get right and wrong about composing for TV in Forgetting Sarah Marshall, if you can remember the the film? I can't. I mean, funny enough, I also mean in that he was. It, it, well, wasn't he doing commercials as well, or have I? I, I think. That? I think he was. I think he was. So I, I can relate to the pain that he went through in that on, on many levels. In I mean, funny enough, I don't do a lot of commercials, but I do. I did, and um, I remember one in particular doing something, and they they might have come back with kind of fourteen rounds of revisions before they decided to kind of license in excess or whatever they they decided they were going to do there. But that's the wonderful, and also they tend to be you know the thing that's interesting when you're doing film and TV, and this isn't necessarily all all commercials at all, but you tend to have, um, you know, on, on kind of adverts and things, there's there's marketing departments and there's not that there isn't again into, but they're writing briefs for the for the composers. So you get these wonderful kind of PDFs that are kind of like book thick that have pages and they say, we want to sound like nothing else. We feel that our color is purple and we're looking for something bright and never heard before. And it's almost impossible to decipher what it means. And what they really mean is we just want Coldplay, but they can't say that. And so it's done in a very, as with when you're working on TV and film, even if people aren't talking in musical terminology, and they never need to, by the way, it's all you're really trying to figure out is the kind of emotional core to something or whether it's, you know, and that's much easier to have um, discussions with people about. And uh, it just feels way more collaborative, I'd say. And so I can totally share his frustration on that one. <laughs> that's great. Uh, the scene of him, uh, you know, he's doing like tones for a crime drama. That's all it is is pads and nothing else. And he slashes the t the, the screen at a at a scoring session. So uh, I hope that hasn't I've, happened. I've been, lucky. I have been I, I've been very lucky with the people I've worked with. That's the truth. <laughs> <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. Awesome. Well, Tom, thank you so much for your time. Uh, I love the show and I love your work in it. So thank you so much. Thank you. Take care. Thanks a lot.